off and on. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Service Shop Procedures class. Uh, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about wheel alignment angles. So uh, most of you guys have had auto suspensions class. So this will be kind of a kind of a refresher for you. Uh, if you haven't had the auto suspensions class, then maybe you'll learn a couple of new things. Uh, that would be pretty cool. Um, plus, uh, you guys who know alignments a little bit, I'm going to be adding uh, a little bit to your knowledge uh, from what you already know. Now, I can't remember, but uh, I don't know if you told me or not. Uh, Wait, when, when did you guys have alignment class, and who was your instructor? How many months ago was it? I had mine, like, within, like, four months ago with Mr. D. It was a while ago. No, it was, like, five months ago. It was in the beginning. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, it was kind of in the beginning there. Cool. Well, yeah. I was impressed with your knowledge there, lab assistant, as you helped a few people along. So I want everybody to get on the alignment rack, uh, whether you had the class or not and work with somebody who knows, or I'll put my lab assistant uh, over there with you, or anybody else uh, who wants to help. I think that will be uh, very beneficial to you. So you notice when we pull up on the alignment rack, uh, we pull up on a four-post rack, and that rack has to be level. So anything we do on the rack, it has to be locked, right? So you know when you let that rack down, it goes click, click. Uh-oh, got to let somebody in. The rack goes click click, click, and every time it sits, every time you hear that click sound and the rack is resting, then that rack is level. Uh, in my day, when I used to do alignments, we had to actually pull legs out. So when we lifted a car up, we had to pull four legs out, and then we had to let the rack sit on the actual legs uh, in order for that to be uh, adjusted. Now, what do you think... Um, let's see whatever answer you guys want to tell me if you know. When we hang those things on the wheels, what are those things we hang on the wheels? I'm going to go grab one. That's a question to you. They're sensors. Okay, so somebody says sensors. Pretty good, pretty good. Actually, in my day, we worked with, um, they were called projectors. And they actually were called sensors. Today, that's not what they are. Oh, that's yeah, not what that thing is. All that thing is, when we hook it up to a wheel. Okay, so I got it on a junk wheel from uh, inside the room there. So all we're doing when we hang these targets up is we are hanging a mirror. That's all it is. It's a mirror. It's a target. Okay, and so this target that you see here it attaches to um, all types of different wheels, and it's adjustable. And I think it can go up to, I want to say, a 22, a 22. If somebody brought a 24 in, I don't think I can get these targets on. They actually will adapt uh, to different wheels, uh, and you can get them up to like 26s, I think, if you buy the adapters. So anyway, these are actually mirrors or target. So what's happening is, um, if you pay attention to the machine, the machine has cameras on it, and, and it blinks little red lights. And so as those lights are blinking, it hits the target, and then the target bounces the light back to the camera, and then depending on which way this wheel is tilting, that's what shows up on the screen as numbers or an actual picture of a tire. So the, these are targets. These actually break pretty easy. So if they hit the ground, this is glass. So we don't want this to hit the ground, of course. We're supposed to put bungees around here. I'm supposed to wrap a bungee cord, attach it to the wheel, so that if they accidentally fall off, the bungee cord uh, will hold it. Now, if you notice on the machine, are all the targets the same size? All the targets? No. No. We've got two small ones and two large ones. So where do the large ones go? So these large targets, they go furthest away from the camera. So when you look at the machine, you'll see four targets for four wheels. And the larger targets always go to the rear. They always go to the rear. 
okay? Because the camera's got to go further back to get that line of sight. So every now and then I see students put the large ones on front. And uh, sometimes it works, depending on the type of car you're dealing with. Uh, but the larger targets go to the rear, okay? So setting the machine up is going to be a piece of cake because the machine actually tells us what to do. So you don't have to know much uh, about alignments to actually do an okay alignment. But my problem uh, with teaching alignments is I want the students to actually know what they're doing. Not that we just put these targets on and all of a sudden I'm turning some bolt uh, and then the numbers uh, wind up uh, in the green. That, that's what I'll ask you a little later. I'll say, hey, guys, uh, how'd your alignment come out? And the students will say, well, everything's in the green. I'm like, uh, no, 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 no. Come on, man. It's not a McDonald's cash register. We can talk a little more professional than everything's in the green. So the alignment rack is set up in such a way, the way they sell it, the, the way these people who sell these racks, they would say something like, uh, hey, uh, anybody can use this thing. It's so easy. Anybody can use it. And so they're telling the employer, come buy this $40,000 machine and you can make any monkey run it, right? So the employer thinks, hey, I can make anybody do good quality alignments. And that, that of course, is not true. Alignments have to do with um, uh, getting the wheel straight, as you kind of already know. But if you remember my, one of my favorite sayings, uh, every job is easy until something goes wrong and something always goes wrong. So uh, alignments are easy until something goes wrong and something always goes wrong. All right, so the first angle I'm going to start with, I'm going to talk about it on the board. Uh, and then I've got pictures we'll look at and we'll kind of reaffirm um, what you're looking at. So in, in an alignment, uh, it's actually called a four-wheel alignment. So when you get an alignment, it's called a four-wheel. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, a four-wheel alignment actually costs more money than something called a two-wheel alignment. So when I was your age and I was starting out in alignments, all the alignments were basically called front-end alignment, two-wheel alignments. And we all we had to do was hang projectors, and the projectors had a light bulb in them, and they would shoot a beam of light. And the customer paid, I think back then, oh my goodness, back in the late uh, 70s, like 78, 79, 80s, we were doing $20 alignments. So for $20, we basically would set caster, camber, and toe. And that's it. There, there's nothing else. And most of the time, we would set uh, just toe, front toe. Today, since your car is uh, independent suspension in the back on many vehicles, and your vehicle is, a lot of vehicles are all-wheel drive, today it's called a four-wheel alignment. Now, there are some cars out there and trucks that do not take a four-wheel alignment. You can't align the rear wheels if you wanted to. Yet, uh, your job is going to charge them for a four-wheel alignment as if they can Right? They think they can make money off of everything. But certain vehicles require a two-wheel alignment, and it should be less money. It should be less money. So if the students can get a car on the rack straight and set up the targets and get the machine to read a little bit, I always think the, the student is doing pretty good. <clears throat> so the first angle uh, I'm interested in is called caster. Now, these angles that we're talking about, they actually are supposed to be checked and done in order because one angle affects another. So this is my definition of caster. Uh, caster is a weight projection type of angle when you look at it. Now, caster has to be seen from the side. So if we were looking at a uh, McPherson strut and then we're looking at the tire, and this McPherson strut, there's no fender here. This McPherson strut is basically uh, straight up and down. So if that uh, device there is straight up and down, uh, can you give me a number for the caster? I need a number. 
Zero. Zero. Excellent. Excellent. Gentlemen, please do not be intimidated uh, by my artwork. I've actually gone to art school. And when I was in fifth grade, I drew a picture and Miss Sally said, uh, well, she said I drew a really good picture. Okay. So anyway, Caster is straight up and down here. And so it's a zero. So I don't need a protractor and I don't need a fancy uh, machine in order to tell that. Now, the one thing you need to know with caster is which way the car is going. So I'm going to give you an arrow for all of the pictures here. And we're going to say the car is going this way. The car is moving forward. Forward, in this case, is that way. Now, take a look at this one. Same angle, caster. But now I'm tipping the McPherson strut back. Or you could think of this almost like a bicycle, because all bicycles, all bicycles on your front fork have to have this type of caster. Okay, hot shots, for those of you who know a little something about caster, this is the front. My fork is leaning back. What caster is this? Forty-five. Okay, about a 45. Uh, a good, a good, uh, good answer, by the way. Excellent answer. Um, however, um, I'm looking for, is it zero, positive, or negative? When the fork leans back. Negative. Is it positive, positive. negative, or zero? Positive. Yes, this is uh, a positive caster. All bicycles and anything that's moving forward is pretty much going to be on a positive caster. Now, the way I look at this is it is a weight projection angle. It has something to do with the weight of the tire in movement. So let's take a look at this. Let's say this tire is moving somewhere at about, uh, I'm going to say 60 uh, miles per hour. All right, so I got my tire moving at 60 miles per hour. That's how fast the bike is moving or the car. And the weight tries to throw itself outward, but it can't land that way. The weight either has to land up or down. So in movement, the bottom of this tire is very heavy. Positive caster makes the bottom of the tire extremely heavy in movement extremely heavy in movement okay now here comes the trick question because of positive caster what did your mama tell you to do when you was riding on that bike because positive caster has some benefits boy don't you do that on that bike nobody ever told you that what can you do because of positive caster on your bicycle Oh, you can ride with no hands because it keeps on going in the same direction. You got it. You can ride with no hands. I wasn't expecting you to get it that fast. I usually trick folks for a long time with that question. So you must know a little something. So positive caster makes the bottom of the tire extremely heavy. It doesn't want to go right. It doesn't want to go left. It basically wants to go straight. Hey, one of the coolest things I ever saw uh, on I-65, I live out in the country, as you know, and on I-65, uh, it's kind of a straighter highway. And every now and then, I see a guy on a motorcycle riding with no hands. So he's, I don't know, he's got the bike on cruise. He's doing this. And, of course, a bicycle, I'm sorry, a motorcycle has heavy positive caster, which makes the wheels go straight down the road. Isn't that deep, man? That's awesome. And we want that on a car. Oh, and by the way, a car is not going to have 45 degrees of positive caster. If it did, you couldn't make turns. It would be real hard to turn the car. So a car has like two degrees of positive caster, maybe up to six or seven. Um, the, the more high performance the car is, the more high performance the car is, the greater the positive caster. Uh, because on a Corvette, you would want more stability. This angle is going to give us stability. Where on my, uh, I don't know, 
my Kia, my Kia Rio, I don't need a lot of positive caster on a Kia Rio. It's not a performing car. Okay, so we know what zero is. We know what positive is. And of course, now watch what happens to negative. Okay, so I had a, I had a student say something interesting about caster. And that kid blew my mind. He says to me, hey, Mr. Young, Mr. Young, Casper is the friendly angle. I'm like, no, no, son, it's not Casper. It's Caster. Casper was the ghost. No, Mr. Young, seriously, Casper is the friendly angle. And I said, man, what are you talking about? Well, and he goes on to explain that Caster does not wear the tires out. So we can have a bad caster. It's not going to make your tires wear out like camber and tow will. So he called it Casper, the friendly angle, like it was Casper, the friendly ghost. So I said, man, that's pretty cool. So look at this one. This caster here is negative. All right. And a negative caster throws the weight behind you. Okay, as you move at 60 miles an hour, which makes what part of the tire very heavy in motion? What part of the tire gets heavy in motion now? Going straight. Okay, we're going straight, but what part of the tire is heavy? The front? Oh, the top of it? The top. It's, it's very good. It's the top. Because in positive camber, the bottom is heavy. In negative, I said camber, by the way, excuse me. In positive caster, the bottom is heavy. In negative caster, the top is heavy. All right, get ready for the trick question. Get ready for the trick question. What device do you want to have a negative caster? You use them usually once a week. Once a week, you'll use this. That is, what what device? Cart. Oh man, I'm trying not to give you any hints. It's a shopping cart. I was going to say use once a week. My wife shops once a week with a negative caster shopping cart. Shopping carts are set negative, which means what? It means the bottom of the tire is very light. It makes it easy to steer. So I got a homework assignment for anybody who wants some extra credit. Uh, you can go over to Menards, Home Depot, any place where they have a flatbed cart. You and your buddy uh, get on a flatbed cart, push each other around the store, and take a selfie with you pushing your buddy in a cart. And, and you will you know that you will. Well, no, after class or tomorrow. I'm down, Andy. Let's go right now. Let's go right All now. Let's and you'll get extra credit. Okay. And if anybody stops you and says, hey, who told you to do this? You tell them, Mr. Zellick told me to do this. All right. Okay. So they Mr. know Mr. Zellick. Zellick. Yeah, Mr. Zellick told you to do this. Okay. If you notice on a negative shopping cart, I don't know about you, but I still do it today, man. If I come out of Aldi and, the, and I got enough groceries in there, I like to push the cart real fast and jump on it and let it give me a little ride. And, of course, you'll notice the wheels are always doing this. The yeah. wheels are fluttering right? Because the bottom is not heavy. So a negative caster makes the vehicle easy to steer. There are not any vehicles that I can think of today that have a negative caster. Okay. We need a positive caster because of how fast we move in traffic. But in the old days, they had certain trucks and delivery vehicles that were set up on a negative type caster because they weren't supposed to go very fast. And a negative caster allowed the truck to be steered easier. You didn't even have to have power steering because this is a form of power steering. As the wheels are moving, they are easier to steer on a negative caster. But a negative caster makes the wheels flutter. Okay, so most cars today are going to be in a positive type of caster. There is no negative caster that I can think of. Then why is a car at negative caster? Why is it when it's on the rack, I'm reading negative? What happened? Something's bent. Yeah, something is bent. 
And usually what got bent uh, in a caster, if you think of it, right, we've got the wheel, we're on a negative caster, and of course at the top you have that strut bearing, right, those three bolts, and then of course, you know, you have a spring here. Okay, I'm going to say we're negative by about uh, zero. So I'm going to say we are 1.0 negative. So I'm not quite straight up and down. I'm a little bit forward because of the upper strut bearing, which is a big chunk of rubber on top of a strut. That upper strut bearing is weak, and it has allowed the top of the strut to move forward. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, if the top of the strut moves forward, that's going to give me a negative caster. If the top of the strut moves too far back, I'm going to have a heavy positive. So more than likely, if you have a negative caster problem, more than likely something is bent. You got a bent strut tower. You got a bent strut tower that bent at the top. But you could have had a big enough accident or hit a pothole in such a way that you bent the tube. Remember, the shock absorber or the strut is basically a tube. Let me go over here and uh, grab one here. So then you wouldn't even, so you wouldn't just notice the harder to steer, but you would also notice how, like, when you hit a bump, your car would probably bottom out a little quicker because your strut is bent, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. If you think about it, um, positive caster and negative caster, they isolate road uh, uh, impacts. So if you have too much positive caster, you feel the road more. If you have a lot of negative caster, you feel the road less, but the wheel is floating. So here's a uh, small McPherson strut, right? And it is possible that the whole tool, tube got bent. The entire tube is bent just a little bit now, not much. Or it's possible the top of the tube is bent, which, of course, you should know is called a strut bearing, an upper strut bearing. And it is possible what the strut sits on is bent right here because the strut sits inside or is attached to something called a knuckle. So all of those things can be bent. Uh, my guess today is on most modern cars, caster cannot be adjusted. It's not like an angle and I can go fix this. So I would predict, I would say on about 80% of the cars, you can't fix this caster problem. Only way to fix it is to replace what is bent. And many times the technician cannot tell what's bent. So he replaces a lot of parts he doesn't need to. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Now, if you guys ever look at the top of a strut tower, you notice that the top of the strut tower, let's get rid of the strut itself, and let's just look at the upper bearing plate. Now I'll just redraw that. So there's some tricks we can do when you get to know your alignment stuff really good. Okay, you have usually three bolts that hold in your strut tower, sometimes four. Uh, you got the big nut in the top here, big chunk of rubber and steel. So it is possible for us to take the strut out and we can alter the body of the car. Oh, uh, what do you mean, Mr. Young? Well, the three holes that the strut fits in or four holes, let's say, we can actually elongate those holes by elongating the holes. This means I have to die grind the body of the car and make the holes that the strut fits in elongated. Now I can do what to the top of the strut in order to change caster? Move it. Right, okay, it, let's say I need more positive caster. Since I made the holes that hold it oblong, I can now slide the top of the strut back. And by sliding the top of the strut back, I increase positive caster. Or maybe I need more negative caster. So I'm sitting here, but I need it to sit here. So once you understand the logic of what they're looking for, you can make all type of altercations to the car that will work perfectly, that will keep the consumer from having to spend thousands of dollars. And I've done this over my life of my career. You know, this guy needs all these parts in order to get the car to drive right. 
but I can get the drive writing done if I alter the body of the car and make it go back half an inch. I can make it drive right. Isn't that crazy? That's the stuff we can't teach you because that's advanced alignments, right? I got to teach you the basic stuff before we get into the advanced stuff. And we only have time here at Lincoln to teach you the basics on how something works. So is that also the same thing basically with like camber plates? You yes. Know how they have like a whole plate under the strut tower that goes right yes. under it, kind of like a bracket and move it around? You got it absolutely right. But think about it. Caster is forward or back. But if we buy a camber plate or alter the body a different way, I'm getting ahead of myself here because I want to show some uh, other pictures here. Uh, here, you see what I did with my oblong? I made them different, which, of course, now would do this to the tire, bring it out or in, which would actually change camber. So here, I'll hold the strut up just for the heck of it. So a second ago, when I oblong the opposite way, I was taking care of caster, which is forward or back. But if I put the crosshairs differently, I can make the strut go out or in, which, of course, affects camber. Camber is the inward or outward tilt at the top. And they got plates, shims. They've got cam bolts. They have all type of accessories that we can use in order to get the alignment back. I've had dealerships tell the customer, you know, they need to have the frame straightened and that sort of thing, where in reality, there is another way. There almost always is another way. All right, let me, uh, let me split my screen here. And I'm gonna go over to, uh, well, first let me move my cameras around, I guess. I'm going to go over and take a look at some pictures I had students draw uh, throughout my time here. Uh, okay, so there's me. So let me go find, uh, I might as well do present. So I want to present, and I'll pull it over to that screen. All right, let me go find... Uh, find what I'm looking for. I think I'll pull it out of my, uh, uh, where did I put those things at? Oh, I know where I put them in my, uh, in my photos. Uh, uh, so caster camera, there they go. All right. So these are some pictures. Uh, I had uh, students draw for me. Let's see. So that's that's camber. I don't want that one. I don't want that one. I don't want that. There we go. I'll go with this one here. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, so let's uh, go back. Let's pause that. Okay, so uh, usually depending on what class I'm teaching, I usually make students do a project in breaks, electrical class. Uh, auto suspensions. I make them draw out the pictures. And so I forgot this student's name. I'm sure he wrote it on one of them. And uh, just to get you to understand what these angles are really doing. Uh, I don't have a drawing project for you guys, so I guess you're okay. But as we discussed earlier, I have a tire. I have a McPherson strut. Doesn't have to be a McPherson. I just use strut because it's most common. You know, you could have a control arm. They do the exact same thing. And so since my strut is straight up and down, this is the front. I am at zero caster. Okay, that was easy enough. Now, when the strut leans back, when the top of the strut leans back, here's my front where the arrow is. I am definitely at a positive caster. So most cars sit like this. So I would call this, uh, if I was looking at a projector, a protractor rather, uh, if this was zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this is about 10 degrees. He's got about 10 degrees of positive caster. Uh, I submit to you guys that 10 degrees is probably way too much. More than likely, the caster is going to be two, three, or four degrees of positive caster. So if you go look at a car right now, 
And if you could see the McPherson strut, because you know you got a fender here, of course. But if you could see the McPherson strut and you're looking at the car sideways, you're going to notice that strut is tipped back just a little bit. To you, it may look like zero. To me, it definitely looks like a positive tilt towards back. So pay attention to it. When you guys come into the shop um, tomorrow, we got cars up in the air all the time. Start looking at the cars sideways and pay attention to the strut. You're going to notice it tips back just a little bit. Question or comment here? Nope. Hey, do you hear uh, that banging sound through my mic or no? I don't know. Not really. Oh, there's a guy out here banging on a wheel or something. I'm like, man, that's loud, but I don't know if you guys hear it. Cool. All right, here's the next one. Okay. I'm expecting not to see this. I'm expecting never to see this unless we've had an accident. I'm at a negative caster. This is the front, of course. The McPherson strut is literally leaning negative. And because of that negative tilt, this car is going to pull. See, caster makes the car pull, and it also makes the car shake. You literally could have a customer tell you something like, uh, hey, my car shakes, and I want my wheels balanced. When in reality, it's not his wheels at all. It's he's hit something. He's got a negative caster. And the faster he goes, the more the vehicle shakes. And you balance the tires and look at the runouts and all the other things. And you're like, man, everything's perfect, but this car still shakes. But if you put this up on the alignment rack, you would realize his caster is out of spec, leaning towards negative, which is actually um, uh, making the tires bounce around as if they are, um, well, a, a, a shopping cart. Basically, like they're a shopping cart. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff, isn't it? All right, let's go find, uh, let me go see if I can find something else here. I had uh, a shot of this another way. Uh, okay. Let's go see if I can uh, find a little movie on Caster here and kind of explain it. Uh oh, I don't want, I don't need it now, do we? Want to just play? The primary functions of caster are to improve direct. Uh oh, that ain't going to play. So I guess I won't use that. I'll have to go back and uh, load, load of that puppy up. So say goodbye to that guy. Uh, all right. Now with Caster, I'm going to put some numbers on the board here. And I'm going to explain to you which way Caster will actually make a car pull. And then you tell me which way the car pulls. Oh, uh, what are you talking about, Mr. Young? Well, think about it. Uh, if your two casters are not the same, casters have to be equal on both sides. If your two casters are not the same, they will generate a pull. All right, Mr. Young, uh, what, what will the pull be? Uh, I don't know yet. Um, we're getting ready to get to that. All right, so I got to think here. All right, so let me tell you the scenario. Here's the scenario as to how it goes. Caster always pulls to the least negative. Caster pulls, I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly. Caster pulls to the most negative. That's how I could say it. Caster also pulls to the least positive. So you could say it that way too. So caster pulls to the most negative negative of the numbers, okay, or caster pulls to the least positive of the numbers. Uh, I think I said that right. Oh, uh, Mr. Young, I'm not getting it. All right, well, let's, let, let's go to the board. All right, now, I just explained what caster is. 
but Castor is on the right and left sides. So an interesting question would be, hey, Mr. Young, you were talking about four-wheel alignments. Is there caster on the rear wheels? And the answer is no. No, there's no caster on the rear wheels. The caster is only on wheels that steer right and left. So there's no caster on the rear. Uh, I think there may be a caster on some vehicles that have uh, rear wheel steering, but that's kind of rare that you would see those. Okay, so caster is only on the front. Now these other angles, uh, we've got uh, camber and toe. You actually have those on the rear. Okay, so in my numbers here, I am only talking about the front. Okay, so on the front, and we are talking about caster. Okay, and on my left, this is my left, on my left side, I have 3.5 degrees. Okay, we do caster, camber, and toe. We pretty much do those in degrees. They can also be done in inches, and they can be done in minutes and seconds. So the machine that we use, everything's in degrees when you look at it. All right, now on the right side, uh, on the right side of the front, I have 2.1 degrees of caster. My question is, which way will the car pull? Will the car pull right or left? Right. The car will definitely pull right by how much of a pull to the right? How much of a pull? To get how much, we subtract uh, 2.1 out of 3.5. How much of a pull do I have? Uh, 1.4 degrees. Yes, I have a 1.4 degrees of pull advantage to the right. Now, the reason I tell you this is because when we look at camber, Camber will also pull a car. So I need to know the difference between my camber pull and my caster pull. That will dictate which way the car goes. That will dictate which way the car goes. So you have to know the difference between the pulls for caster and camber. Camber's coming up after the break. And then the greater difference is the way the car pulls. It's the way the car pulls. Although, uh, Mr. Young could be wrong in his explanation, depending on what road you're traveling on. Uh, what you talking about, Mr. Young? Oh, man, this gets deep. This gets deep. So I would think North Avenue, let's see. First Avenue is like that. Because when I get off of 290 and I go north on First Avenue, First Avenue is a, uh, I want to, I, I, I want to tell you, but I want to see if you know. First Avenue deals with rainwater real good. So here's the rain coming down. Okay, so those are rain droplets. So this is a trick question. First Avenue deals with rain really well which means the road is shaped a certain way, and, and that shape has a name. Anybody know what that is? Doesn't it have, like, that bank? Or kind of like the oh, man, doggone it. You guys are too doggone smart. It's no fun teaching you guys. You guys could teach me something. You're right. First Avenue's got a heavy bank to it. It's called a road crown. And First Avenue has a heavy crown to the right. So that when the rainwater hits it, we have a gutter off to the right. So First Avenue has a heavy crown to the right. So I notice when I'm riding down First Avenue, my car pulls to the right. But then when I get on another road, it doesn't pull as heavy. So it depends on the crown of the road and the way they handle rainwater. So depending on where you at, right? Depending on where you at, 
will dictate how your car pulls. Now, watch this, guys. Watch this. Watch these numbers. Okay, so on my left, I have 3.0 positive caster. And then on my right, on my right, I have 2. Point, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to say it like this. I have 3.5 degrees caster on the right. So my question to you is, which way does the car pull when my caster is set up like this on First Avenue? It goes straight. It goes, oh, dang, I give up. I give up. Mr. Young, Mr. Young can't fool nobody. Nice job, Andy. Now, the car goes straight down the road on First Avenue. Goes straight down the road on First. Because hey, Young, I got a, question. a natural tendency to pull to the left. First Avenue tries to pull you to the right. The car goes straight down the road on a Crown Avenue if it was set this way. Very very good. Yes, your question. So when I'm driving and I pull up to like a red light, you know how like usually when you pull up to the red light, there's kind of like that like slump where cars stand for a while. Yes. So when I pull up to there, usually I feel like if I'm braking, I feel my car pull me either which way. Is that because of the, the bank or because of the crown? Um, let me let somebody in the room here. Hey, to answer your question, it will take over an hour. So let me answer it to you. Let me answer it to you this way, because this gets incredibly deep. Your, your question is really good. Now, look here. My caster being unequal makes me go straight. To answer your question partially, there may be something wrong with your car. Now, I wouldn't I doubt it. It's a BMW. Okay, it's a BMW. Okay, uh, BMW may not have this issue, but the Volkswagen, some of Audis do, and some other cars. Hey guys, look at this. Here's your engine. Here's your transmission. So here's my engine. Here's my trans. And watch this, guys. This gets really deep. Depending on how your trans is set up, it is possible that you have one long drive shaft to get out to one of your wheels, let's say the passenger side. And then let me put the wheel here. Okay, now this is deep. I wasn't expecting to get into this, but your question is so good, man. Understanding this is gonna help you out. Now, your other drive shaft to your other side of the car is actually relatively short. And this brings up a, a, a scenario of a pull. And this pull has to do with acceleration. So if you think about the power that your engine generates, you generate a lot of torque in the engine, goes into the trans. But look, look what happens. The torque gets out to this wheel first. And so I'll call him the um, right side. Let's see, what would that be? Let's call them left. We'll call this the driver's side. Left so side. This is like this is torque steer, what you're explaining, right? Oh my gosh. Don't tell me you know what torque steer is. Well, yeah, but I don't, I, the thing is, I don't have a front wheel drive. I have okay, hold on. Hold on. Let's just hang with torque steer because torque steer, understanding this, will answer your other question. Okay. So it, I told you it takes a long time, but I'm, I'll be done for a break. Okay, so under this scenario in my Audi, when I accelerate, the car will pull to the torqued wheel first. And this one here gets the torque. So under acceleration, you are going to pull to the left if you accelerate hard. A heavy pull left when you accelerate hard. Now, to, to stop that, if the drive shafts are the exact same size, you don't have torque steer. You don't have it. Now, to answer your question, your question has to do with the brakes. Your question has to do with the brakes. Uh -huh. Now, it is possible that one of your brakes works harder than the other for whatever reasons, tight calipers, rust on the rotors, 
one rotor fat, one rotor skinny, okay? Now that changes everything because you are brake steering the car now, which means as you come to a stop, if one of your brakes is working better than the other, you will have a tendency to pull to the side that's braking the best. Isn't that oh, deep? Okay. Isn't that deep? Now, you guys already know a lot of this, and then we'll take our break here. Guys, on a Mercedes-Benz, on a Lexus, a Audi, BMW, any car that has um, basically autonomous braking, lane change technology, they can actually steer your car by the brakes. They steer your car by the brakes. So let's say I'm in my S600, and I'm falling asleep, and the computer knows I'm falling asleep, so I'm, first of all, the car puts a coffee cup in the dashboard, and it goes, do, 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 do. Little coffee cup is in the dashboard, and it says, you know, pull over, get some coffee. Then you don't pay attention to that. You're still drifting, still driving stupid. Uh, the steering wheel vibrates goofy, and the seat starts shaking. You know, the car tries to wake you up. All right, now, I am lane drifting. So as I lane drift and I come out of my lane, the computer knows I'm lane drifting, and so the computer applies this front brake over here. And when he applies this brake here and leaves this brake loose, the car will drift to the side that's braking. And if I drift too much that way, it will apply this brake over here and drift me this way or drift me that way. That is a form of torque steer, which is we're using the brakes in order to keep you in the lane. Now, you tell me that's not some crazy stuff, right? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. So it is possible that when you come to a stop, one brake is working a little better, and it always kind of chugs to one side or the other. Awesome, awesome questions today uh, from you guys. I am so impressed. I am so impressed. All right, let me look at my time here, and let's take a little break. Uh, let's come back at, uh, I got 11.09. So uh, let's come back at 11.30, boys, and talk about camber and tow. And my lab assistant is going to be showing some pictures of some heavy uh, cambers that we don't want uh, to actually have. So see you guys back here at 1130. Yeah. Man, we're going on break and I just got here. What's wrong with this? Man, I guess uh, you should have been here an hour ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, good morning, Mr. Young. Mr. Young. Oh, yeah, I got, I'll stop the record. Thanks, guys. Back at 1130.